So uh, next week we're going to do this holding the center, uh, the tension between prophecy and order. All of this is taking place in that first 400 years of Christianity. And, uh, and this is where, we're, you know, today we'll talk, go back to uh, Constantine, around 300, in the Roman Empire. And here uh, we'll see as Christianity develops uh, a tension between the per- sort of prophetic side and then the orderly side, you know, the decency and good order and the structure versus the sort of more wild. And this is where we'll talk about monasticism. We'll also talk about this situation here. With This is Santa Paula running a sort of women's uh, scholarly bunch uh, there, uh, there uh, in Bethlehem, actually, and a very, very wealthy woman. Her husband dies. Uh, she has two daughters, who one of which also becomes a saint, and they are running this women's uh, scriptural thing. You know, whatever it is, we don't know. A book club, and uh, but they are the funders of Jerome, and Jerome is the guy who translates the Bible into into the Latin. And, uh, and so we'll talk about that situation and other situations. There's a guy who lives on a pole. You guys know Simeon the Stylite? Come next week for Simeon the Stylite, the guy, uh, the guy who lives on the pole, you know? And uh, there's people who, uh, one of the words coming out of the Greek is athletes for Christ. Uh, people who are, you know, individually sort of athletes for Christ. And they're, they're part of this prophetic side, you know, this, these folks who live in the deserts, monks, you know, and stuff. And... And uh, we'll talk about them and their relationship to the structures and things like that. Are you making this a little less loud yeah, through th- it, yeah. in the room here? All right. And then, uh, and then we'll finish off with uh, uh, what happens around the years, you know, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200, is that Christianity had gone global. It was in China. It was everywhere. It was in India. It was all over this big, strong Christian church. There are as many Christians under the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Babylon as there are as the Bishop of Rome around 800, you know, 900. But global Christianity declined, you know, and there's a big catastrophic thing, you know, with the rise of Islam and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, what survives is this sort of biblical stability of the church. So the, this, we'll talk about the truck structure here, and, and that'll close us off. But all of this to the effect of talking about the Bible and scriptures and its role within, you know, the larger thing of Christianity. Hopefully it'll be fun. Feel free to interrupt at any point and raise your hand, talk, uh, ask questions. Um, all right. So it's on friendship, right? And I'm going to try not to sing. All right. All right, here we go. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Hell. You see you often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer Have we trials and temptations Is there trouble anywhere Should we never be discouraged Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find his friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Covered with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge, take to the Lord in prayer. This is a great song. <laughs> Blessed Savior, thou hast promised. Thou wilt all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to thee in earnest prayer. 
soon in glory bright unclouded there will be no need for prayer rapture praise and endless worship isn't that great isn't that, uh, this idea, there'll, there'll someday be no need for prayer that's sort of a great idea all right all right uh let me get this here I know, you know, camp songs. I, I was really excited when the pastor did his camp song today. Yeah. Isn't that fun? A lot of those good old camp songs. All right. Uh, all right, so uh, let's get in here. This is our issue. This is our focal point of the whole class, is that relationship of the church and the Bible. And you have here, uh, this is an old... 16th century, this is deep, deep, you see it in churches throughout Europe, the idea that the structure, the church, built upon the, the scripture there. And then this here, on this side, this is uh, Jerome, who we'll talk about next time. He's the one the ladies funded to, uh, this is the Old Testament, New Testament, build the church. And this is Augustine. And we're going to talk about Augustine today. And Augustine is the... Uh, you know, Pastor Jerry always emphasized Augustine a lot. He is just a very key figure for interpreting and helping us understand Paul, especially in the, in the, in the Bible. All right. And what we've seen uh, is that there's been this grand story, a preparation of the gospel. Uh, you know, God didn't just sort of, you know, zap down lightning and create a church or a Bible or something like that. They grew, and they grew out of a cultural life that was much bigger than just Judaism. It entailed the whole of the Persian Empire, and, and then later the Roman Empire got wrapped up in the Greek culture of Hellenism, you know, which is where this Greek language is what the Bible, the New Testament is written in. The Old Testament is translated into, into the scriptures in, in Greek. And then you get <coughs> great scenes it's in the Persian Empire. Uh, you know, uh, Jeff mentioned it today. Cyrus. You know, we can't get away. Cyrus is the one who wanted the Jews to rebuild that temple. And so Cyrus, and, and this is uh, Ezra. Ezra comes a couple, you know, there's Cyrus, and then there's later Darius, and then there's Xerxes, and then there's Artaxerxes. And it's under Artaxerxes is when the temple gets finally rebuilt. But it's uh, Ezra reading the scriptures, you know, after the return to rebuild the temple. And so that relationship of the temple and scriptures, which we talked about going all the way back to the tabernacle and the ark at the very first class, you know, is there's, there's this correspondence of writing and a building. And we need to talk about this building stuff because the, the idea of, of the building is important, but it's, as, you know, we... We at our church know it's the fellowship that goes on within the building. It's, so the building is a symbol of a fellowship. And, and, uh, but this idea that, you know, Ezra reads the law, and then this creation of what is a synagogue culture that keeps expanding as Judaism spreads, and the temple becomes harder to get at, and you need other, other ways of the Jews to worship, is the synagogue becomes a key part of Jewish worship. And the synagogue leads into the church. And so this is Jesus then. And that great passage where Jesus, you know, takes the scroll and reads from Isaiah. And then he rolls up the scroll. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And he's talking about himself just sort of standing there, you know? Uh, so, you know, there's so much that all goes down in this, but we're focused on in this class sort of that cultural development of what is uh, the, the church and this place where you read scriptures and the relationship between the two. Uh, this is Eusebius. Uh, he lives at the time of Constantine, and we'll talk about him again a little bit. But he wrote a book called The Preparation of the Gospel. He writes it around, I don't know, the year 280, 290, something like that. And he talks about all these issues we're talking about in our class. It's like that, uh, that God 
was reaching into Greek culture and Egyptian culture and Persian culture and all these different places and developing things which were then Christians are going to pull together and the Jews pull together. And uh, this is an important thing for us to remember is, is how much uh, we are embedded in culture and uh, the culture that is even not Christian and certain things like... Uh, like uh, uh, um, I guess I'll tell you this. I, I don't know. I'm a Peggy and I were talking last night, and we think we're folksy teachers. <laughs> Peggy, we're folksy, right? Folksy is where we digress a lot. But but the thing is is uh, <laughs> is, is is the I uh, I read some things about Stephen King, and and I thought I need to read a Stephen King horror novel. Uh, you know, I had never done one, you know. So I, I looked up what one Stephen King thinks is his best, and then I read this Stephen King horror novel. It's about vampires and stuff. And the thing was, it's deeply Christian. I don't think he's a Christian. I, he has a Catholic background, I think. But, but the thing is, is that it's, it, it's these, all these vampire stories are about evil and the blood and the cross and sacraments and and I'm thinking you know I, I'm not recommending vampire novels but but the thing is, is yeah you go into our culture and stuff is there for us to draw from and say this is Christianity is not at this level among in the earth it's not so f different from everything we can we can draw people in you know, from all these different religions, all these different cultural aspects, by emphasizing where we connect. You know, and a lot of people have that sense of joy, desire that love that we talked about today in the service, and, and, the, and that, that sense of evil, which is very important. Uh, because what do we need to be saved from? Is It's out there, and we need that salvation. We need to be saved from something, you know, which is a world of evil. So, so the thing is, he talks about this, and this, this preparation of the gospel, and how God had been doing it, all this sort of thing. And so you have, we've done this in the class, this sort of review, as we've looked at the development of what was called the ecclesia. And the ecclesia is the word the Bible, New Testament, uses for church. And uh, Aristotle talks a lot about the ecclesia, and uh, this is the word used also by Herodotus and other people for the assembly, the democracy side of things. And so it's when people gather to make decisions or to be wise together as a group, you know. And uh, Aristotle, famously in politics, talks about people think better in groups. That's why we have juries of 12 people make a decision. We don't just let the judge decide things. We, we want 12 people to get, and the more important the thing is, we want unanimous, everybody to agree, you know. So people do think better in groups. That's a deep commitment in a whole lot of the ancient Near East especially, but it also goes to Confucianism and also goes to other places too. And, and then, you know, so this idea that the Greeks call an ecclesia, the Bible gives us this in Greek that Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia. You know, and that's the word we use for that's the God is going to, he's going to build a church. And when he says that, he uses the term, which is the culturally accepted term for a, a big word of, about how people think better when they're in fellowship with each other. And people uh, need to fellowship with each other to make decisions and be wise. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay? So, and then the other side of that is the scriptures. And so we talked about a scribal culture developing, especially out of the Persians, really promoted it. And then the Greeks and the Romans really promoted it. And this idea of a reverence for writings, you know. Um, we saw it in the story of Daniel, about how Daniel didn't want to throw those guys in the lion's den, but uh, he had signed a document. Dang it. <laughs> Idiot you are. What? Not Daniel. Not oh. Daniel. The king. The king. The, Darius. Excuse <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, Darius. We do think better in groups. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Darius 
throws Daniel in the lion's den. Darius doesn't want to throw Daniel in the lion's den, but Darius has to because he has signed a document. And this is our foundations of how we treat written law and how we have written constitutions. And written law is more stable, strong, and authoritative than oral law, things like that. And these reverence for the written, you know. So becomes very important. And then the development of liberal arts, which is an educational program, and uh, for, uh, for Aristotle, liberal arts is to promote, you know, good government. And citizens need to be readers. They need to communicate. And so liberal arts has this heavy emphasis on the skills of reading. And then, uh, and we talked about how this is in our, in our Bible, this idea that there are these holy scriptures. But then, Timothy, you know, all scripture is breathed is God breathed, and this is the word for inspiration. You know, all, all writings have some sort of like, you know, something in them that brings them more power than oral, oral communication. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, training, you know. And so this, this, this statement here would have been agreed to by lots and lots of other cultures besides Christian and Jewish in the, when it was written, you know. Uh, it's a very just practical, good advice to Timothy. Any questions about that? Yes. Yeah. All scripture is God's but that's talking about the holy scriptures. What about the Vedas and the Upanishads? Would you say that they're God-breathed? Yeah. Really? On the basis of this. This word here is just writing. We put the scripture, we use the scripture word, but that's graphe. But, but the pre preceding word says right. Holy Infancy, you know the holy scriptures, and then there's a, a distinction that this is all scriptures. Mm -hmm. See that this is, you know, this is a different word for uh, than used over here. So I think you should. <laughs> I'm glad you question it, and and um, uh, this is a big deal. Uh, but it, what I'm coming from is that larger preparation of the gospel idea that, uh, that um, you know, I, Esther and I talked about, you taught Eastern, Eastern literature. I teach Confucianism. I teach the Upanishads and stuff like that. And there's a lot of wisdom in that stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stuff that I correlate with my Christianity as, as really good stuff. And so in that sense, yeah, those... Those writings which have been revered for thousands of years usually have a lot of what is not specifically Christian wisdom, but certainly wisdom that, we, that enhances our understanding of the, of the Bible scriptures. Yeah, that's the idea of general revelation, or common grace is another term for it. It's that, you know, God has spread out all sorts of joy and love and wisdom all over, everywhere in the world. Uh, you and I have the responsibility of, we have the best revelation. We have the most specific revelation. Uh, our scriptures are better. You know, we can say that because, what? I'm never saying they're equal. I am. Not, you see, that's the whole thing. It's a. It's a reverence for. Uh, it's like, um, you know, Judy and we were talking about books last night. You know, and just read books. It's good to read books. You know, uh, certainly reading. You know, some books is not. You know, the the Bible's the best book to read. You know, it's the. So there's a scale to this. Um, but the thing is, is that uh, to see ourselves uh, in a world in which God, uh, and we'll talk more about this right now, but the, 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 that God has, has not only just uh, given us a, like a little special box to live in. You know, we, we live in a world in which uh, the idea of ecclesia and the idea of the reverence for writing is, is very common, and it's a common grace for the world. Uh, it comes from God. Yeah? Hey, how does Confucius get this idea? 
How did Confucius get his ideas? Uh, yeah, that's a good... Uh, do you have what you want to... <laughs> Yeah, this is that idea of a, a conscience that we have it in, in our heart. We all know the right and wrong, you know. So he, he simply just observed humans, yeah. observed yeah. nature, yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, also uh, learned from people that observed from the nature yeah. earlier, yeah. Yeah. and then come up with his you know, better conclusions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's gathering data and then, you know, right. analyzing uh, it and... Uh, right. and Okay. Okay. I agree. I think that God breathed term is, yeah. Uh, Confucius would certainly not say his analects are God breathed. Right. Yes. Because yeah. Say, okay, yeah. Yeah. God said, yeah. And then, you know, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, yeah. Well, the Jews by this time had lots of writings besides what we right. consider the Old Testament. Right. And, and so uh, their rabbis had mm -hmm. written uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of things that they used, uh, that they organized their life yeah. by. Yeah. And so if, you're, if you have two distinct words for scripture here, and you have holy scripture uh, modified for one type of writing, Holy Scriptures make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ. Yeah. This is a very healthy discussion. Uh, we want to stop it and move on, but the uh, but it, it's very healthy to think about this because that's what we want. To, we're, we're trying to do this is thinking about the Bible, and, and I'm coming at the Bible in this class. Uh, I think we all agree to it. At, at a basic level, but at another level, this is just practical advice that uh, that like the some Greek classroom would have also uh, talked about. Uh, it's you know uh, this this is you know someone reading this would not find that strange at all. Uh, it wouldn't jump out to them that there was a distinction, some some specific writings uh, being talked about here. So yeah. Mm -hmm. and the Old Testament. Um, during the Hellenism period, did the Greeks give honor and respect to the Bible and preserve it as well? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, especially uh, within the Alexandrian Egyptian uh, culture, you know, the you have Philo, the Jew, who's uh, writing in Greek, who's, uh, you know, big on honoring the, you know, figuring out the scriptures. And um, so... We're not talking, yeah, the Greeks are not book burners, you know, the Romans are not book burners. They, 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 this is that idea that we, you know, we're not trying to, you know, uh, limit what people read. We're trying to actually encourage it all to come together. So um, just, we need to move on. But the thing is, is, um, is that uh, uh, the cultures of that time uh, and, and here again, I'm talking about a broad term of culture. There's individuals that are always, you know, doing weird things all over the place. But, but the, uh, the culture of the times, this, this, I mean, you read our Constitution into this. People write about our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution is a type of holy, separated documents. And that's what holy means, is the type of separated document for a special dignity, you know, and stuff like that. And then it's all useful. I just, I'm just arguing or pro encouraging you to look at this without necessarily jumping to a type of biblicism 
which is a different idea, which is that we believe very much that the Bible is this very distinctive document. I would say distinctive. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. In their purpose of making all the Jews Greek, uh-huh. they could have destroyed the scripture to make yeah, yeah, the Jews Yeah, Greek yeah, Greek. yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no book destruction stuff going on. Even, yeah, yeah. I mean, in a way, yeah. it's like, like the Jews were protected in Babylon, yeah. the Jews were also protected yeah. even though they were sacrificing yeah. pigs on the altar, yeah. they were still protected. Yeah, yeah. Right, and we're, I, I, I'm going to be talking about 400 years here of Christianity, and, and we're sidestepping a lot of the martyrdoms and stuff. There are individual persecutions, individual martyrdoms, and stuff like that. But on the whole, uh, the, the Roman Empire is very sort of uh, encouraging of a syn- syncretism of things, uh, unless, unless you, it was teaching something that was actually dangerous to Rome, and then they would, they would squash you. Uh, yeah, uh, that's the, the Western Fathers. So yes, Jerome and Augustine are most comfortable in Latin. That is their language. As is uh, Constantine here and his mother. They're most comfortable in Latin. Um, but uh, this is the beginning of the church in a number of ways. But this is, I can't really see it very well here. Uh, this is a letter from Constantine, the emperor who lived around 300. His mom, Helen, uh, St. Helen, is, uh, was a Christian and, and pushed him in a lot of ways. And one of the things St. Helen is looked to as being key in his reign was to push for the creation of churches, especially the churches in Bethlehem and at the Holy Sepulchre and stuff like that, and also to build um, churches in the, like a, the new capital, Constantinople. He moves the, Constant, the chapel over there and capital over there. And so so she is pushing for church building, and then it's assumed that she was also behind letters like this, in which Constantine is asking Eusebius, that other bishop, that, that I'm building churches, you know, I'm building churches, and I need you to, to create Bibles for me, to, uh, you know, put these things together. Now, these are not specifically yet our collection of text exactly. The collection of text has never been stabilized completely, and but then on top of it, though, is, is we don't get a, the, you know, there were still some debates about Second Peter and, you know, and Revelation and things like that, but we want copies of the Holy Scriptures in these churches I'm building, and that's that relationship of church. You're going to have a church. We need the Bible. We need book in there, too. We need the Scriptures in there, too, and so that's, that's Constantine. That's around the year 300, and then we talked about how the Christians by this time, and they starts right there with Jesus during the, before he dies, he's teaching in the Bible that the Bible needs to be read differently than just normal books. And this is where I, I mark the real distinction of the Bible, is that the Bible isn't a normal book. You have to read it with things like, uh, you know, when Moses lifted you know, Jesus says when Moses lifted a serpent onto a stick, that was, uh, you know, that was, what's, what's he say? Uh, even, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He's predicting his own death on a cross, and then he's comparing himself to this cursed figure, the serpent. And he's going to take, the, you know, this is our song, where are the curses found? You know, the curse, we're going to take, Jesus takes on our curse and, he, and dies in this situation of horror. And, but at that same time, this is a Greek god. The, uh, this is uh, Asclepius. And Asclepius also had a serpent on a stick. about, And that was a symbol of health and salvation and stuff like that. We carry it on into today. Uh, both symbols, the Greek and the Christian and the Jewish, all coming together into this sort of pharmacy symbol, which is this really weird symbol of, of health, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's a, this is a symbol for salvation. Anytime you see a, uh, you know, like, uh, you, you know, you, you see an ambulance go by with that on the door, you think, yeah, that is the weirdest thing in our culture. But it's, it, it should make us think, yeah, this is that common grace. God is keeping this, this symbol alive in so many ways, you know, all around us, you know. 
Uh, this is why I always, I always like people who wear those shirts that say Santa Cruz on them. You know, they think they're surfing shirts, but you look at them and go, hey, Jesus, all right, good. You know, <laughs> Santa Cruz, the Holy Cross. Yes, yes. It's a lift up a live fire yeah. serpent. Yeah. He lifts up a an iron. He did an iron serpent. Bronze, uh, bronze, bronze serpent, serpent, iron. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So we're not referring to the snake that's running around. We're referring to what God had to Yeah. You know, this is the thing. Is um, Again, healthy conversations here. The uh, how specific we are taking these things, and how uh, I am moving as a historian, not a theologian. Theologians often are very much a let's let's be really careful about distinctions and stuff like this. And the you know, uh, historians, we like wash with this big broad brush because we're working with just sort of you know we're not coming at it with a theological sort of like specific. We're coming at it like. Hey, there's a snake on a stick being used all over, you know, in the ancient world, you know, and and uh, and Jesus picks up on it, you know. Uh, Christianity has it as its central symbol, and so and then now, you know, so it's a little different perspective. I think we agree, but it's a different perspective, and certainly theology has the right to sort of, you know. Uh, one of the big things that I know, uh, if Jerry were here, we would, we would be going back, is that definition of church. I keep using the church in a big, broad way, which includes the building. Many of us grew up as evangelicals, where you're not supposed to have the church be a building, it's the fellowship in it. And I'm sort of washing over both of them as both. It's a both and rather than an either or. Uh, yeah. So when you say the serpent, then it's not just any. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Okay, uh, let, let's move on, though. All right. Uh, yes? That building there, they actually have a beautiful book bar. Oh, I, I love this building. It's one of the best buildings in all California, you know. This is so cool, this, this building here. And this is Paradise Lost. It's all part of the sculpture is, is that this is the serpent in, in Genesis, you know, coming up to the tree of, of life and stuff, you know. Or, and, uh, oh, you know, wow, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. And uh, what comes from that is this heavy thing that, here again, we as historians can sort of see this also developing in the Persian world. Uh, not the Roman and the Greek, but the Persian world had a very healthy notion of evil uh, and the evil of of a, of a demon figure, a a personal evil, you know, which is what Christianity, what Jesus, Jesus is the greatest spokesperson for in history, a personal evil person, a devil. You know, and you have these scenes like this, you know, in the Bible and, and encounters and stuff. And, and so, you know, and what's, what's the guy offering? The world, you see. And this becomes a big, big point in the Bible. It's a, who, whose world is this? Well, apparently in some way, you know, your C.S. Lewis, whatever, you know, the world has been given over to evil. It's a fallen world. It's the, the devil has the right to offer the kingdoms and the cities and the, to Jesus. And in some theologies, this is like you, the devil is saying you can avoid the cross by, hey, let's do a quickie deal between you and me, uh, and then you can avoid the cross. You know, but yeah, Jesus says no, you know. And, and so this idea is very deep in Paul, especially. Paul explores and develops this separation between our world and, and, and the heavenly world. You know, God really isn't walking around in our world anymore like he did in Eden. Eden was where earth and heaven are brought together, but earth fell 
all creation fell. All creation is cursed, you know. And that's the, out of Genesis and stuff. And, and there's these, you know, these depictions. Paul creates a little parable sort of thing of, of, of God as a potter and we're clay. Now, can you as clay, me as clay, tell the potter we, what we want? No. It's like, you're, you, this is one of those most strictest, disconcerting sort of stories in the Bible is that God really is doing what God does, and you just need to sit down and shut up, you know? And, uh, and, and then you, you know, this is that band, you know, Jars of Clay. I think that's sort of fun. And then you have, you know, he talks about us being jars of clay. And, uh, and we just, this constant memory of that. Now, Paul, Paul writes a lot about that. And I, I give you, how do you know it's Paul? He's got the sword and the the word, the Bible and the, the sword. The sword, Bible's the two-edged sword, you know. I'll give you a couple others, just for the fun of it. I always like these. There's the sword, there's the scriptures, there's the scriptures, there's the sword, you know. So that's always Jesus. Now, now uh, to get past the Bible into church history, yeah, they really need to put a, like a, a rest stop here, you know. And then... We, to, to sit and contemplate this sign. This is one of the most amazing signs of church history ever, you know? Uh, Ventura is uh, Buena, St. Saint, Saint, Saint Bonaventure, you know, uh, Buena Ventura, who was an Augustinian Franciscan, who, you know, incredible guy. Uh, and then we're going to talk about Monica here, Augustine's mom. And then you veer off. Augustine didn't spend a lot of time talking about the sacraments. That's one of the interesting things about Augustine. He doesn't really develop a sacramental theology. And so, therefore, the freeway splits. <laughs> the people who are designing our highways had this all planned out. <laughs> no, all right. All right, so, but the thing is, is that uh, we live in a world which is, you know, and if anything, uh, our class, I want you to really be serious about this. I think that you should go on into theology in a way that you decide more strict things. But on the other hand, as a history class, is to open ourselves up to seeing, wow, you know, all this that sort of like merges and flows together. And so, so you know, you drive down the freeway and uh, see a sign like this and, huh, you know, it's, a, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's food for thought. And if we do believe in a God that, you know, really is in charge of everything, right? Well, God designed this sign, man. Why not? Hey, God designed this sign. Yeah. Is the sacramental, is sacramental as a sacrament? Yeah, that's the sacraments. Well, you didn't say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to say it. You, you said, all right, well, I'm glad you, glad you did that. Yeah. We think better in groups, man. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. All right. Now, let's talk about Santa Monica. This is her. This is her son. Uh, she is a hard woman. Uh, she's a good woman. And her son is a wayward boy. And uh, he needs a good, you know, all the time. Uh, even after he becomes a Christian, he needs to be slapped around by his mom. And, uh, and it's a, Augustine writes this autobiography, one of our first great autobiographies, which is an autobiography which asks, you know, why am I like I am? Why, who am, why am I like I and, and he comes down to, uh, well, you know, this is, you know, the great theologian who has the scripture and is it, it comes down to my, my mom's prayers. My mom prayed for me. She cried for me in her prayers. And she, she claimed that statement, uh, you know, which is, you know, ask and ye shall receive. And, and so she claimed that for her boy. And as he sailed off to Rome from Africa, and uh, so she is the, uh, the saint of you know, moms who have wayward boys, you know, this is what you need to do. And uh, she kept with Augustine as he uh, developed and watched over them. And uh, this is a sort of composite of, of what uh, I would describe for our class as the key elements in Augustinian thought, okay, which becomes very much Protestant thought, very much deep uh, Catholic thought also, 
uh, he's writing this around the year 400, okay? Um, and it's, he's expanding upon and, and working with, everything's right out of the Bible, uh, but especially the, these Pauline ideas about the difference between the potter and the clay. And so uh, the way salvation story is working is that, is that with Eden, you know, the earth and heavenly realms were broken and the earthly realm became cursed. And what God is doing through the cross is bringing eventually the two back together, right? And so we live in this temporary time. And Augustine is one of the great philosophers of time and how it, you know, there's no time up here. Time is actually down here. It's, it's a part of creation, you know. And this is, this is what Einstein says, you know. Einstein, um, and so time is part of here. So in, in our time, we have to realize that we're sort of on our own more. We're left to figure things out more, to be in a world of mysteries and sin and stuff. And we are, we're clay. We're sinful. We're sinners. We're incredibly limited in what we can understand. We all can only see through a glass darkly. And, you know, we, we just can't understand all these ways things go. We do, however, have the image of God in us. No, we're not sure what that exactly is. But what God has done, and this is the... the Really, the, one of the most key elements of all what distinguishes us from so many other religions in the world is God is incredibly communicative with us. So God sends Jesus down to talk to us, and those things that Jesus got written in the Bible, you know? A Holy Spirit comes down to help us out, to be our advocate. Uh, but we are screw-ups, and we need a lawyer, you know? Uh, we need that Holy Spirit. And the sacraments are, are sort of like things somehow that, you know, God is, is, you know, do this in remembrance of me. These things, they sort of hold us together. And the world and our language and everything, the world, full of signs. God is talking to us. So, so I'm, I'm being deeply Augustinian when I say look for signs. Look for signs. Signs are all around you. You know, the, the signs are things to learn about. God is talking to us through all these signs. And, and so, so you have uh, this, this earthly realm. And so this is the, the key to our class today is that we always have to remember how weak we are, how we don't know things. We, have, we live in a broken, cursed world in which the blessedness in it is our our. our gifts of God, the joy, the beauty, things like that. And we have two major institutions in the world. One is the church and the other is the state. This is Augustine talking about this. And both are screwed up. So you see, this is one of the things that's key to Augustine. Augustine does not believe in utopia. He's the, he is the saint of lowered expectations. Do not expect your church to be perfect. Don't expect your priest to be perfect. Don't expect your mom to be perfect. Don't expect any, you know, just constantly lower your expectations because we're, we're clay, we're limited, we live in a world in which we can't, shouldn't have high expectations. And so, uh, you know, the state, and he's, here he's talking about prompt, there are properly constituted governments, and we need a state. Why? Because we're all screw-ups, and anarchy would just make us more of a screw-up, you know? So we need a state, right? And he says at that point, yeah, that's, that doesn't mean necessarily a Christian state. That's just people need good government in general. People need to be governed. And then the church, well, this is where he advocates that we have a structure. We have a structured church. Constantine had done a lot to create what was we called Christendom, which is a type of church that's being used by the government and, and is in, you know, shared. The church is supposed to help the government be better, and the government has helped the church be stable and strong and things like that. So they, we work together. And the church, you see, is that that parable of Jesus is filled with wheat and the tares. Uh, 
in this room, some of us are tares. And Augustine says, just like Jesus said, you're, oh, it's not our job to figure out who the tares are, who the weeds are, you know. We aren't, let the harvest be done by God later, you know. The earth, our churches are, are mixtures of sin, and we're, we're never fully un, uninfected with sin. Yeah. Yeah. Did he talk about that? Oh yeah, yeah. He does a whole long thing on on the wheat and the tares. Yeah. Well, the enemy is real. The enemy is there. I mean, that that's one of the the. But yeah. So Satan also come up with his own writing. Yeah. Yeah. As the medium yeah. of the deity that yeah. he serves. Yeah. Yeah. So Satan definitely are communicating through humans. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Augustine's really yes. Satan's out there communicating demons, all that stuff. Then and this is uh, why the church cannot, at, in our earthly state, try and make ourselves perfect. We cannot try and. And, and separate those who are being overly influenced by Satan from over those being That's influenced God. Oh, you want to the all, the all, all writings thing? Okay, yeah, that's fine. They can go with that one too, sure. Well, let, let's go on here. Uh, my goal, you know, the goal of me, I, you know, the goal of Sunday school is that uh, it's not church. It's, it's that, you know, hopefully you, t- you keep discussing this. Go to lunch. You know, and have a good discussion. But uh, to get, to keep this going, just to get it done here, is uh, Augustine becomes the greatest sort of proponent of Christian liberal arts, Christian schooling, and and Christian liberal arts, if taught correctly, its greatest purpose is to teach how to read the Bible. You see, that's what liberal arts, Christian education, is supposed to do: is teach you how to read the Bible. And especially those skills of reading the allegories and reading the the uh, how the bookends work in in you know Adam fell and Jesus came as a second Adam and try to these are the things that that a good liberal arts education will help you sort of see that the Bible is to be read differently, much more expanded uh, ways than just reading a normal sort of Homer or or Ulysses or something like that, and so this becomes Augustine. And uh, his influence in the church is, is tremendous. And, and, uh, um, but this basic idea becomes the dominant idea. There are people who disagree with this. But the thing is that this idea that there's a heavenly city and we're not it. You know? Remember uh, Jerry used to say, there was always a good thing. To, uh, there is a God and you're not him, <laughs> you know, that kind, of, that kind of thing, you know, is there is, there's a heavenly city, but we're not it, you know, and so this is this idea of, of uh, being more accepting, uh, lowering your expectations, uh, and especially seeing the church as helping the world, and so uh, Augustine becomes involved in what was one of the great discussions and continues to be one of the greatest discussions of church and state is the idea of just war. I don't know if you've uh, dealt with this much, and we don't want to get into it too deep, but, but like, uh, you know, when the invasion of Iraq was happening, you know, the Pope said, I don't want to support George W. Bush uh, because it's not a just war. A just war, there's rules to a just war, and where these rules come from is in long-standing church discussions that go back through Augustine to Ambrose and other people and, and uh, deep into the Christian culture and the political culture of Roman Greece. And, and uh, you know, so this is where you lower expectations. Yes, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. But, frankly, we live in a world where you, that won't work for nations. And uh, you can't turn your 
other cheek to evil. You know, th- and, and here again, he's, he's primarily talking about part of just war is he's talking about uh, properly constituted states, you know, that not just sort of random e- individuals creating their own ideas of just war. But, but this becomes a huge discussion, uh, and it's symbolic in our class here of just how we have to think about everything. Nothing is perfect. Uh, sure, we would love if there was peace in the world, but there isn't. So the church needs to help out, and the church can be helpful in a number of ways. And so he argues Christians can be soldiers within a certain context of a just war and stuff like that. Yeah. Any questions about that? Yeah. And then the, uh, the, but the key idea, the bigger idea, is how do we read the scriptures? Are they just literature, right? Or are they something bigger? And so liberal arts, as he pr- proposed it, is this, is, should be directed toward learning how to read the Bible carefully. And then this idea of a, the fundamental craft, if, if liberal, is, liberal arts is a set of arts, a set of crafts, a set of, a set of technical skills, um, the, the first and foremost technical skill you need is humility. Augustine writes a lot about that. And he, because this is modeled on Jesus. Remember in Philippians, God, you know, Jesus humbles himself. Jesus humbles himself. And we have to imitate that humbling of yourself to move from that heavenly realm to the earthly realm. As a, and so we in the earthly realm have to be humble in everything, especially in our ways we read the Bible. And so he would, Augustine uh, very much would say the scriptures are infallible, which is our language, you know, which comes into the Westminster Confession and on down to a lot of folks today. Uh, but we humans are not infallible readers. Okay, so that's the, that's the sort of key issue here. You and I are not infallible. The Bible is divine. It's a communication from God. It's what God wants us to have, and God worked with human authors to write that thing, and, and, and we are to be uh, readers uh, who come to it ready to listen and obey, uh, but at the same time, um, we understand it to be worthy of obeying, you know, and listening to. Uh, so this is the church and the scriptures uh, that we have, and this is the key for today's class, is this idea that uh, those church and scriptures that have come down to us through all these cultural pathways and get worked and spread and stuff like that, they're not perfect. They're not, they're not what we... Um, uh, or at least the, the scriptures are not like what we can understand. We live in this context of being fallen, and we always have to keep that in mind. And so that would be uh, encouraging of our humility, and at the same time, also an understanding of like why we do church government the way we do, why we have elders who have, you know, in sessions and, you know, different uh, church bodies and committees to make decisions and, and how the Catholic Church and the Episcopalian churches and the Protestant churches, the Pentecostal churches, this, all these different church structures, but we're all supposed to understand that we are fallen, you know, and that uh, we're not going to be like what's in heaven. In that song we sang, uh, we don't need prayer in heaven. See, prayer is, we're going to talk face to face. That's that idea that Paul talks about in, uh, is it Roman, it's Corinthians uh, thir- what, 13. Good job, See, thinking together, Sue. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah uh, that uh, we see through a glass darkly now, someday we will see face to face, you know. And then, so, so uh, this is the, you know, way, uh, so in, in, in a way, interesting way, the Bible will not be sort of needed uh, in heaven, you know. Um, uh, although uh, there is that fun, fun passage where, where in Revelations, you know, there's an angel that comes and eat this book, you know. That's, I like that, eat that book. Okay, and then just to close off, just a little fun thing, is you see this culturally everywhere, uh, throughout history of church architecture especially, but this, here's our church, 
and you have this very heavy, you know, it's very heavy, very earthbound, man, but at the same time, it's got some vertical stuff to it. It's to call us upwards, you know, and stained glass. There's the church architecture is supposed to sort of walk that walk between horizontal and vertical, right? Uh, Sue and I went to this church in Santa Barbara. I love this design. It was just this, but it's completely horizontal, just rigidly horizontal to enter, but the, you, you walk into it, and it it goes vertical completely, you know? And so you're, 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 you're being on that borderline, you know? This is the, the new chapel at, at Point Loma Nazarene. And you see this in new, new, new churches. And I'm not sure what to think about it yet. But what they've done, <laughs> what they've done, you see, is they make it float. The, the, it has a rock foundation, but it's, it's smaller. It's inside. It's, it's this sort of especially at night, disappear so that the building is, and you see at the top, there's also the roof floats. And so you're supposed to get it inside of it and feel like you're in heaven. Uh, now, my problem is that an earthly chapel should affirm its earthliness, too. Uh, and this one doesn't affirm its earthliness as much as I want it to. But on the other hand, it's a uh, you know, it's this interesting idea that you have the vertical and the horizontal, and that we have to be aware of both. We have to be always aspiring to the vertical, aspiring to be heavenly, uh, keeping our prayers, all that sort of stuff. At the same time, understanding that we live in this sinful world here. And both church and scriptures are intimately involved in that life of being sort of half, you know, aspiring to heaven, but at the same time, understanding that we're earthly and stuck here. All right? What? Oh, this does? What do you think, Rebecca? You, uh, you work next to this building. Do you like it? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, and and inside of it, you're you're supposed to. It's very lovely yeah, yeah, it's it's a prayer chapel. Yeah, part of it is, is my struggle is it's it's built on one of the most beautiful overlooking ocean sites in the world, you know, and there's no windows in it, you know. <laughs> that sort of turns it back on the world. So, all right, but whatever. But but think about uh, go and think about these things. All right, let me pray for us. We're done. All right, God. Take good care of us. Help us to understand how screwed up we are. And, and, and Lord, help us to aspire to be better and to, to read our scriptures, to be in prayer, to live the life that you want us to live so that eventually you can pull this all together. Amen.